Man, what a joy and delight it is to be here this morning. And it's good to be back with you guys today as we continue our summer series called God on Film. And this series looks at some of the some films that have come out of this past year. And we can take films and we can see God working through a film with these big ideas and these big concepts and how those concepts translate into our walk with Jesus. And so today we're going to look at one of last year's summer blockbusters. Made a whole lot of money, and it's a great film to watch. It's called Jurassic World. I don't know how many of you have seen that film. How many of you saw Jurassic World, right? What a great film in that whole Jurassic Park series, right? The story of how to uh, go into an island and having this incredible interactive amusement park and the star attraction is dinosaurs, right? I remember as a kid growing up, and I loved dinosaurs, man. Whether it was a brontosaurus or a stegosaurus with the little things on the back, right? Or whether it was the, the huge T-Rex. And then, of course, you got introduced with the Jurassic Park films of these awesome beasts called Velociraptors, right? And they are just killer. And I loved the Jurassic films. And I loved the Jurassic Park films as they, as they dive into the real dilemma of creation, and they dive into the dilemma of the conflict of, of man versus beast, right? And who can't love a great chase scene, right? Being in a car and you've got this huge T-Rex just coming after you, right? Or you're standing in the middle of a forest and you may have this huge automatic rifle with you, but you are surrounded by a group of velociraptors, right? And I love how the fact that it's not the military people who survive, but it's the children who make it out in the end, right? It is an awesome film. And what it does is it takes you into a world that you may have some problems when you walk into the film, but they got big problems, okay? They have problems that are huge. And they're asking the question, how are we going to survive? Well, the truth is, life is sometimes that way, is it not? Life is sometimes we have these moments when we feel like we're either being hunted by a T-Rex or we're chased by a velociraptor, and the question is, when we have big problems, how are we going to survive the moment? How are we going to survive today? How are we going to get through this horrible season that we might be in, in the moment, right? And I want to just encourage you today. The, the whole goal of this sermon today is to encourage you in the midst of problems. And because I believe Jesus has something beautiful to say to us today. And it's going to start with these words from John chapter 16, verse 33. So if you have your notes with you, the little shepherd notes handout that came, it's yellow. And it's got uh, part four of our series. Would you open that for just a moment? Because I'd like us to read this verse together from John chapter 16, verse 33. So go ahead and find that for just a moment. If you've got your Bibles, you can open up to that. But I'd like us to read this verse together, okay? And so on the count of three, let's read it together. Ready? One, two, three. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus says, here on earth, you will have many trials, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Will you do me a favor? Will you underline that phrase, you will have? You will have. See, there's sometimes in the Bible we have to really make some, some, awesome, some very important clarifications here. Jesus doesn't say to us today that you won't have trials. Jesus doesn't say to us that trials will never happen. Jesus says to all of us today is what? You will have them. I'm going to have trials. I'm going to have sorrows. I'm going to have tribulations. In fact, the ESV version puts these two words, trials and sorrows, together, and it translates it tribulations. So my life is full of tumultuous moments, right? But here's the thing. When Jesus talks about trials and sorrows and tribulations, we need to make sure we understand something just very clearly. We need to understand the distinction of what he means by trials and sorrows and what we tend to think of as trials and sorrows, okay? So we live in America. And we have this problem that a lot of other places don't have, right? Other than other industrialized nations. We have what's called first 
world problems, right? Okay? You know what those are, right? I mean, you've seen the commercials. They've been on the internet. We make fun of them sometimes, right? It's like the little kid in Africa who says, you telling me, you know, about drinking water, right? And, and so you pour, I love the one. It's like, you telling me that you do a challenge where you dump a whole bucket of water on you and we have no water to drink at all, right? That's a first world problem, okay? All right? So here's the deal, right? When we talk about problems, we often think of things as this. Jesus is not talking about that moment where your dishwasher breaks as a trial or sorrow, okay? All right? He's not talking about that moment where your roof starts to leak as a trial or sorrow, right? He's not even talking about that moment where your car breaks down on the side of the road, right? As a trial or sorrow. He's not referring to when that moment happens that you're unfriended on Facebook as a trial or sorrow to go through, right? Okay? And he's definitely not speaking about that moment, right? When your latte from Starbucks comes out wrong, okay? Or your order from McDonald's isn't correct, okay? Those are first world problems. They are neither trials nor sorrows. But when Jesus speaks about trials and sorrows, when he refers to tribulations that we go through, what he is talking about is the moment when our faith rubs up against the world. Let me say that again. When you go through a trial or a sorrow, a tribulation or a difficult season, what he is speaking about is that moment when your faith, your love for Jesus, who you are as a Christian, rubs up against what's happening in the world. That's a trial. That's a sorrow. That's a tribulation. It's when you feel a tension between what God wants and what you want. It's when you doubt His promise versus the reality that you're experiencing. It's when you undergo a frustration about following His will versus taking a different path. But here's God's promise. He makes two promises in that verse. Not only does He say, you will have trials and sorrows, but he also says this, and it's beautiful. It's awesome, right? He says it with a loud proclamation. He says, I have overcome the world. Say that with me. I have overcome the world. One more time. Ready? I have overcome the world. Circle that. That's huge. I have overcome the world. And what I want to do this morning is I want to unpack that. I want to unpack what it means for God to overcome the world so that we may embrace our problems. How does Jesus overcome the world so that you and I can embrace our problems? How does Jesus overcome the power of sin and death and suffering so that we can embrace these problems that we face? But in order to do that, I need you to do a little work this morning, okay? So on your notes, you've got a list of things. And here's what I want you to do. What's your biggest problem today? Okay? What's your biggest problem today? You've got a list of them there. For some of you, your biggest problem that you're facing right now is work. How am I going to work and live out my faith? How do I go to work every day, maybe to a job I don't like, but I want to honor the Lord? How do I go to work and I'm, and, and I'm not able to use my gifts, my talents, my passions, how God has created me? How do I embrace my theology of work, the tension of work as a Christian? Maybe your biggest problem today is a relationship one. You got a problem with a spouse, a sibling, a parent, a best friend. You're having some real relational dynamics and tension, and, and you're wondering how, God, are you going to work through this? Maybe your problem is financial. You're just broke, right? Okay? Maybe you're, you're in debt up to your eyeballs, right? Maybe, maybe you can't see your way out, okay? Maybe your problem is health today. How do I honor God with my body? My health isn't in a good situation. I'm having some, some pains and difficulties and struggles, God. Maybe... Your biggest conflict this morning, if we're honest with ourselves, is God himself. And maybe you want to mark that. Maybe you just want to say, you know what, my biggest conflict right now, my biggest problem, my biggest trouble and sorrow, is my relationship with God himself. Okay? Just be honest about that, okay? Or there's a spot for other, okay? And so just take a moment. What is it today? Where are you at in this moment in time that you have identified, this is my biggest problem that I need God to speak to today?
All right? And here's the key reminder. It's on your notes. The key reminder in all this is we don't avoid our problems. We don't run from our problems. We don't ignore our problems. But rather, today, I want you to believe this, is that you can embrace your, your problems as an opportunity to grow in the gospel. Let me say that again. I believe that every person in this room can embrace whatever problem that they're facing as an opportunity to grow in the gospel of Jesus. Here's what James says. Look with me together. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the church, right? Whenever trouble comes your way, he says, let it be an opportunity for what? Let's say it together, church. What is it an opportunity for? Joy. Say it with me again. What's it an opportunity for? Joy. Joy in your faith. Joy in the Lord. Joy in your family, right? For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, he says. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character, perfect and complete Lacking in nothing, James says. And so what James invites us to do is to embrace our problems as an opportunity to grow. To embrace our problems as an opportunity to live in the gospel in the moment. And it invites us to ask ourselves this question, who am I really trusting today? Who am I really counting on in this difficult moment? Who am I going to depend upon in this hard time? Who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to God's voice or am I going to listen to the voice of someone else? What about my character needs to be perfected and completed? How does God help me embrace my problems because he has overcome all things? So let me give you five ways this morning. Just five simple ways. Number one, this is on your notes. Sometimes God uses problems to direct me. God uses problems to direct me. The first truth that we want to embrace is this. Sometimes God takes trials and tribulations, sorrows and sufferings, because he wants to direct my heart in a certain direction. He wants to take my mind and lead me on a certain path. He wants to take my decision making and shape it and form it in a certain way. Okay, let me give you an illustration of what I mean by this. Let's say you go to the doctor and you're feeling constipated and bloated. Anyone ever feel constipated or bloated in this room before, right? And you go to the doctor because you're feeling constipated and bloated, okay? You just feel kind of puffy on the outside, right? So you meet with the doctor, right? And after doing a complete health evaluation, he determines that the problem is simple. You eat too much popcorn, okay? That's the problem, okay? You eat way too much popcorn. You are addicted to popcorn, okay? And so the doctor says the way in which you're going to combat this problem of feeling bloated and puffed up like popcorn is to stop eating so much popcorn, okay? You just got to cut back on it, okay? One bag a day, not 17 boxes, okay? Let's just cut back on the popcorn, okay? So the doctor has given you direction, and the question is, what will you follow? Well, God is the same way. Sometimes God simply wants to take a problem so he can give us direction on where to follow. Solomon says it this way. Look with me on Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Here's what he says. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord, the Lord determines our steps. See, in my heart, I can make lots of plans. Anyone ever made a plan in their heart before? Okay. All right. As men and women, we can make lots of plans in our heart. I'm going to be wealthy, right? I'm going to be successful. I'm going to marry this person. I'm going to have three All-Americans. I'm going to, and you fill in the blank, whatever it may be, right? And so we have this moment where we start to plan things in our hearts, and then what happens? A problem arises. And the problem interrupts the plan, right? And so my plan was to eat all the popcorn that I possibly could ever imagine. But the problem erupts is I'm feeling constipated and bloated because of all this popcorn. So the doctor gives me direction to stop eating popcorn. And so now I have to determine, will I follow my heart where it says to go and the direction and plan that I have? Or will I listen to God and his voice? Which direction will I take? Will I try some vegetables instead of popcorn? So maybe, just maybe, 
we need to be able to see that sometimes God uses a problem to direct my steps in a different way. That's number one. All right. Number two, this is a hard one. Sometimes God uses problems to inspect me. Okay? Now it seems like kind of weird. Let me explain that. Sometimes God uses problems to inspect me. All right? God sometimes wants to use problems that arise in our life to show us things that we want to ignore. Okay? Sometimes God uses problems in our life to show us things that we want to avoid, ignore, or hide from that we don't want to acknowledge or admit that is going on. Let me give you an illustration of this. Okay? How many of you have ever bought a home? Anybody bought a home in this room? Okay? All right. How many of you have bought a home, and before you bought the home, you hired an inspector to come check out the home? Right? Okay. And what does the inspector do? He walks through the entire house, and he sees what is right and what is wrong. And then he gives you a report about here is what's wrong, and here is what needs to be fixed, because it's going to cause a what? Problem. It's going to cause a problem. And so the home inspector shows you what is wrong. Sometimes, this is what God wants to do. He puts a problem, a sorrow, a tribulation in your way because there's a problem he wants to fix. There's a problem he wants to show you. He wants you to search deep down what really is going on. Look at Psalm chapter 139, verse 23. Beautiful phrase from the Lord. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. The invitation is quite real. God, search me. Look in my head and look in my heart. What's really there? Look at what's really going on. Now, that can be a bit terrifying for people if you ask me, right? God, show me who I really am. Because what God wants to do when you hear, see, when we invite him to search us and know us, here's what's going to happen. God is going to reveal three things. All right, if you want to write these down, you can. But here's what God's going to reveal. Number one is he's going to reveal your blind spots. Okay? You know how when you get in your car and you're driving, you got to have mirrors to show you your blind spots, right? These are things that you can't see when you're in the car, right? Well, guess what? As people, you have blind spots, and I have blind spots. Now, some of you are sitting thinking, I ain't got no blind spots, right? Here, let me, uh, I'll show you real quick, okay? Ask the person next to you who knows you the best, and they will tell you your blind spots, okay? That's who will tell you what your blind spots are. That's the person who will tell you the things that you're missing. I see some looks between people. Maybe we shouldn't go there right now, okay? All right? They'll tell you your blind spots, and so will the Lord. The second thing that he'll reveal when you, he searches you to know you, your heart and your mind, is he's going to reveal to you your idols, He's going to tell you, these are the things that you're worshiping more than God, okay? He's going to tell you, these are the things that you've kind of supplanted and put God second place and this first place, okay? All right? And then the third thing he's going to show you is what's negative that needs to be removed. He's going to show you the negative things that he needs to weed out, okay? Now, this happens all the time when people run into problems with money, okay? Okay? Anybody ever run into a problem with money here? All right. See, when you find out that you have a problem with money, they're broke. You're spending too much. You're in your eyeballs up to debt, right? And you ask God to take this problem and show me what I'm ignoring, right? What it's going to show you is your blind spots. Maybe you don't budget well. He's going to show you your idols. Maybe you're spending money on things you shouldn't spend. Maybe he's going to show you, right, things that need to get rooted out of your heart that are taking you in the wrong direction, that the treasure of money has replaced God as your first treasure, okay? And so money does this wonderfully. It illustrates this just quite beautifully of how God can expect me and show me and search me in this moment, okay? Now, here's the key. When God leads you to start digging down deep, to search, to know me, to show me what I don't want to see about myself, okay, it has a purpose. It's to show us our blind spot, our sins, and our idols. But then, here's what happens. We get to join with King David in this beautiful prayer that he has written. Because let me, let me tell you why. The pro- when God shows you your problem, it's not to make you a better performer. Can I say that again? When God shows you your problem, it's not so that you can start to perform better for the people around you or for God himself. 
The purpose of showing you your problem is so that you can be purified by the God Almighty. Listen to what King David says. But you desire honesty from the heart, so you can teach me to be what? Wise in my inmost being. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Why do I want God to search me? So that I can be changed on the inside. So that what causes this impurification, this dirtiness of sin, can be washed and made clean and I can be purified. And then I can approach my problems from a place of grace and forgiveness. All right, that's number two. All right, so God wants to direct me. God wants to inspect me. God also wants to use my problems to, and this is hard, correct me. Okay, correct me. See, sometimes, sometimes problems are there to show us how far we are from God. All right? Sometimes we run up against problems, trials, tribulations, sorrows, so that God can say, hey, listen, let me wake you up. Okay? Let me show you what's wrong. Let me get your attention. Because let's just be truthful. There's two kinds of people, right? There are introspective people who will take the time and search. Okay? Some of you are very introspective people. You'll, you'll take the time, you'll search, you'll ask questions. Some of you are knuckleheads, okay? All right? And when you're knuckleheads, okay, you need God to wake you up a little bit, okay? You need God to kind of hit you over the head with a two by four, right? Okay, so sometimes in my life I can be introspective and sometimes I can be a knucklehead. Sometimes I need God to search me and show me what's wrong. And sometimes I need God just to come and take a two by four and hit me over the head and say, wake up! Listen! Here's how it works. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. Look at it with me together. God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means that we will share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Amen, right? No, no parent likes to discipline and no child likes to receive discipline. I can still remember the first time my daddy spanked me with a belt, okay? I mean, listen, I'm 40 years old. It happened when I was five years old at my Aunt Cat Betty's house in San Antonio, Texas. That's how impressionable it was. I can still remember it, right? Now, I was being a turd, okay? And that's why I got my belt whipped, okay? I was just being like a turd around my family. And so Dad took me into the room and took off his belt, which he had never done before, right? Thank God he never did it again, right? Even though I probably deserved it. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Okay, so, 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 so but there was a moment of discipline. Okay? It was a moment of discipline, right? He didn't, probably didn't enjoy it. I definitely did enjoy it, but I remember it, and it left an impression. Okay? No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. Yes, it was. Okay? But afterward, there'll be quite a harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Now, I need to do something before we move on to the next one. Because this is so prevalent in our society today, I just need to do something. I need to make a distinct, uh, I need to distinguish between punishment and discipline for just a moment. Can I? Here's what I want to do. I want uh, just, I put this on your notes and I think it's important for us to recognize when it comes to God, there is a difference between punishment and discipline. Punishment says this, okay? You did something wrong, all right? And now you're going to pay for this, okay? Discipline says you've done something wrong, now you're going to pay for this, all right? Discipline says you did something wrong, but I'm going to correct it, and I'm going to use it to show you how much I still love you, care for you, and want the best for you, okay? Punishment and discipline are two different things. And we have to be very careful in our culture today to make sure as Christians we communicate a very important message. The problems, trials, sufferings, and tribulations we face are never a punishment for sin. When you have a trial, when you have a suffering, when you have a tribulation, when you have a sorrow, God is not punishing you. Let me say that again because I want to make sure we all got it. God is not punishing punishing us and here's why because that would invalidate the cross if God was still punishing his people for sin it would negate everything that happened to Jesus on the cross now 
Do we have earthly consequences for sin? Yes. It doesn't take rocket science to know that, right? I got a speeding ticket on the way home from, 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 from Texas to Alabama, right? There's a consequence. I got to pay the ticket, right? Okay? So my sin was speeding. Got to pay a ticket. There's a consequence, right? Okay? You know, that, 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 that happens, okay? We have earthly consequences because of bad decisions, but that's not God punishing us for a lack of faithfulness. If you are a child of God, you never have to worry about God punishing you for a lack of faithfulness. Can I say that again? Because I think it's so important. Because I'm tired of preachers on television or news outlets and medias or people who don't know what they're talking about saying, that's God's punishment for that. That defeats the cross. God does not punish his children for their lack of faithfulness. He punished his son for a lack of faithfulness, our lack of faithfulness. He punished his son. It is very clear in the scriptures, right? You and I can day say thank you to Jesus that he took the punishment that we deserve upon himself. He took the pain and suffering and sorrows that we deserved upon himself. Look what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 53. But Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. I am healed and you are healed. Jesus took our punishment. And so today we say thank you, Jesus, for taking the punishment that I deserved and you deserved. And we live that way. Now, with that being said, does God discipline those he loves? Yes, he does. Does God correct those he loves? Yes, he does. But now it is an act of love and grace, not a punishment for sin. It gives us a chance to experience God's grace and be changed. And so I, let me give you an example, because I know some of you are wondering, well, what does that look like, right? What does it look like for God to discipline his children? And I'll just give you an example from my own life, okay? When I was a sophomore in college, um, I loved to play ping pong, okay? Anybody in the room like to play ping pong, okay? I love to play ping pong, okay? The ping pong, we only had one ping pong table in college, okay? It was right in the middle of the student center, okay? And so every day people would gather to play ping pong, and whether it was against the, the baseball players, whether it was against my friend Nari from Africa, whether it was, um, you know, against whoever was there, we played ping pong during class, we played ping pong after class, we played ping pong all night long, okay? And I was just a ping pong freak, okay? Well, while I played ping pong, heaven for Betsy, right? I'd kind of let my emotions get the best of me, okay? All right? And I would slam my ping pong table, my paddle on the table. One time I hit a window and I thank God it didn't break, right? Scared the poor bookstore director out of his mind, right? Um, but I would also let a few choice words come out of my mouth quite often, okay? Now, you guys know this, my voice is loud, okay? All right? So not only is my voice loud, but you could hear it through the entire student center. How the dean of students didn't come down one day and like say, what is going on here? I have no idea, right? But anyway, I would, you know, drop a few bombs, say a few words, you know, curse the ping pong ball if it didn't go over the net, right? And I would say things that were just really un unbecoming, okay? And, um, and, and everybody knew kind of who I was for the most part. So one day we're in the student center and this guy walks up to me and I have no idea who he is. He's a friend of a friend, okay? And he pulls me aside kind of back inside near the bathroom area and he said, your name's David, right? I said, yeah. He said, and you're in the, <laughs> at, <laughs> you're in the pre-seminary program, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Uh, he, said, he said, you're a Christian, right? Now I had never had anyone ask me that before. And I really just kind of, I just stopped for a moment. He said, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, I believe in Jesus. And he said, and this is what he said, and I just, I'll never forget it. And I don't remember the exact words, but it, it was something like this. He said, it pains my heart to hear you speak in such a way because I know you love the Lord. Now, I wanted to drop a bomb right there, man. I'm like, dang. But I had to stop. And I had to pause and I had to think and I had to go, what am I doing? And in that moment, God was using that man who I didn't know one bit, right, to discipline me in the moment. 
because of me. But he did it in such a loving, caring, gracious, corrective way that I, I couldn't get angry. I couldn't get defensive. I couldn't, you know, tell him to, 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 to flip off or whatever, right? I was just in the moment completely humbled by his graciousness in my life. And, and it caused me to really start to think about the, the words that I use. Now, does that mean I never cussed again? No, that, that's not, that definitely has not happened. Okay, but, but it really has made me kind of watch things for a moment in how I use my language. And in that moment, God disciplined me through the, another brother in Christ to correct a problem that was going on in my life. Okay, so that's just an example of how God in his graciousness disciplines us. All right, number four, this is the big one. God uses problems to show us that he loves us, okay? God, shows us his pro God uses problems to show me he lo his, his love, okay? See, sometimes we go through a problem simply so God can say, here I am, don't forget me. Here I am, I love you. Here I am, I'll be your savior. Because the truth is, most of us have a God complex, okay? Most of us think we can fix most of our problems, most of us think we can handle whatever life throws at us. Most of us think that we can, whatever is coming our way, we can come up with a plan, we can craft a, a solution, we can handle things on our own way. And so what happens is we begin to take the place of God, right? We think we can fix it, we can make it better, we can correct the issue, we can get her done, okay? But the problem is, many times, we're going to come against a trial, tribulation, suffering, or sorrow that is so much bigger than us, it leaves us speechless. It's so much bigger than us, we don't know what to do with it. It's so much bigger than us, we shut down and ignore it. It's so much bigger than us, we kind of walk away, put our head in the sand, turn away from it, get mad, get angry, whatever it may be. And I think in that moment, God is saying, hey, listen, the reason you have this problem today is so that I can show you who I am. I can show you my love for you. I can show you that I am the one who rescues, saves, delivers, that I am a good father and a gracious redeemer. I love what Psalm 91 says. Look at with me for just a moment. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. Notice the I wills. I will rescue. I will protect. I will answer. I will be with them. I will honor them. Maybe the problem you're going through right now is because God wants your attention. Maybe the problem that you're going through right now is say, will you trust me to save, rescue, deliver you today? Because the greatest problem in the world is the problem of sin. And that's why Jesus came. He is the one who has overcome the power of sin, the sting of death, and the problem of suffering. He has done that for us. And it's all out of his great love for you and for me. So maybe your problems is just so that God can say, I love you, and I'm with you today. And here's the last one. And let's close with this. God uses problems to strengthen me. God uses problems to strengthen me. Now, this last one's going to be a bit counterintuitive, and here's why. Because when we look at people and we look at stories, the people who have gone through adversity, difficult trials and tribulations, we take someone like Martin Luther King, or we take someone like Rosa Young, or we take someone like Wilbur Wilberforce, or we take some of the great heroes, you know, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, and we look at the problems and adversities, the trials and tribulations that they've gone through, and we say, wow, look at how what? strong they were, right? We look at how courageous they were. We look at how adventurous they were, right? And we say those things. But God is counterintuitive. God says, instead of me saying, how, look how strong I am, maybe what I need to do in order to become strong is admit how weak I really am. How weak and powerless I really am. Maybe the problem that you're going through right now is so that you will admit to yourself the most important thing you could ever admit to yourself. I'm actually a pretty weak person. I'm actually pretty powerless. I am actually have no clue what I'm doing. I actually, there's no way I'm going to fix what I made wrong. And maybe, just for maybe, what God wants us to admit is how powerless we really are. So that his grace can demonstrate its sufficiency in our life. And so that his grace can say, look, in the midst of your powerlessness, I 
will make you strong. I can handle this for you. I have overcome all things on your behalf. I have done what you can't do and will ever be able to do. And so as we close in prayer, what I like to do is just simply say this. If you have a problem today, whatever it may be, how is God using this problem to point you to Jesus and his grace in your life? Let's pray. God, I know when people come into a room like this, everyone brings different problems. Some are relational. Some are family. Some are money. Some deal with work. Some have health issues. Some are conflicted in their relationship with God. Some are just uncertainty, doubt, or whatever it may be. And so my prayer is just simply that you will use these problems to draw us closer to Jesus. To bring us deeper into an understanding of the gospel. To see how in weakness God makes us strong. To see how he is sufficient for all things. So that we can experience a love that is unlike anything else. May that be so today. In your name we pray and we all sit together. Amen.